Good morning. I'm Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I represent Florida's 25th Congressional District in South Florida. Thank you all so much for being with us today. I want to mention up front that today's effort is not a formal Appropriations Committee event, but it would not be possible without the generous assistance of our Chair Kay Granger uh, from the great state of Texas and her incredible team. It also illustrates the bipartisan nature of this issue, and I am a proud member of the Appropriations Committee. I'm grateful to have so many incredible women leaders here to speak on this heart-wrenching, difficult topic. And I ask that, I'm sorry, we just had a very difficult briefing, so um, I'm still a little bit overcome. Um, I'm grateful that my many of my colleagues are here, that we have incredible women leaders who have joined us. Um, this is a, a remarkably difficult topic, so I ask that participants keep their remarks brief and succinct <clears throat> in the interest of, uh, of ensuring a robust discussion. <clears throat> on October 7th, Hamas, Hamas launched a horrific attack on Israeli civilians, resulting in the deadliest day for Jews since the Holocaust. A day has not gone by for me when I haven't felt the sharp pangs of pain from this tragedy. And I know from conversations we as Jews have had every day since October 7th that we are all changed by this crisis. I, I, I want to emphasize that people should know that it is not just Israelis, but Jews worldwide that have carried the heavy burden of these atrocities since October 7th. Since that day, I've been doing all I can alongside my colleagues to take action in support of Israel and Israelis in their time of need, including being in the region on October 7th and traveling back there just a month ago. Our bipartisan bicameral recent delegation traveled in January to meet with regional leaders with the sole purpose of galvanizing the multinational effort to press for the release of each and every last hostage. In Congress, I've had the privilege of leading my colleagues in special order hours on the House floor where each member spoke about a hostage that remains in Gaza. We showed their beautiful faces and shared their stories so the public knows that these are beloved members of families and communities who matter and who must come home. We've heard personal stories of mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, sons, and daughters that sometimes get lost behind the statistics. And today I am humbled to be among so many leaders from the Israeli and U.S. governments, civil society, and congressional colleagues to bring awareness and discuss a tragically ignored and even disbelieved and denied weapon of war that Hamas used and continues to use against innocent people, sexual and gender-based violence. This morning before we began this program, we met with Israeli law enforcement to hear about the ongoing investigations into Hamas's use of sexual violence. I, I can't go into the specifics of the investigations and the, uh, the, the, the details that were shared with us, but I have never seen more sadis sadistic evil perpetrated against another human than in the photos and videos that we saw earlier this morning and that many of us saw um, in the videos that have been shared uh, to make sure that people understand what happened and the atrocities that were committed and the clarity that is evident about Hamas's determination to destroy the state of Israel and to kill Jews anywhere we are in the world. The stories we heard were horrific and heartbreaking, but it only deepens my, I would say, our conviction that we must draw attention to and secure justice for these victims of Hamas's terror. For far too long in the United States, and around the world, victims of sexual violence have felt that they could not come forward with their experiences. Survivors were left in the shadows, and perpetrators remained at large without accountability for their actions. However, in the past decade, society and, our, and society's attitude began to shift. A movement took, rate, took, took root that centers on survivors. After years and years of women feeling alone and disbelieved, society finally began to embrace accountability and prioritized listening to and believing survivors' accounts. However, shamefully, after October 7th, when Israelis bravely came forward to share the horrors they experienced or witnessed, there was silence, or even worse, categorical dismissal of their stories. They were questioned, 
even accused of being part of a PR campaign and doxxed and threatened on social media. UN Women, the UN body dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women, took almost two months to produce a pitifully inadequate statement in response to Hamas's appalling acts. The evidence is abundant and beyond compelling. Through survivors coming forward, witnesses, video footage, and independent analysis, we know that Hamas's use of sexual violence, including rape, mutilation, and brutality, was not an anomaly. It was a premeditated part of their strategy to purposefully use sexual violence as a weapon against innocent civilians. Before we continue, I'd like to frame today's discussion by reading from an op-ed published by Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, who is with us today. This apparent reluctance, this is her quote, to believe the accounts of Jewish women, a stark deviation from the global commitment to believing survivors and to condemning such acts, mimics patterns of Holocaust denial, perpetuating a cycle of anti-Semitism by furthering the stereotype of Jews as untrustworthy. Such denial of Jewish women's experiences is a significant anomaly and needs to be called out for what it is, a stark manifestation of deep-seated anti-Semitism. I could not agree more, Ambassador. I'm honored to be joined today by this incredible group of leaders who stand with Israeli Jewish women who experienced unimaginable horrors at the hands of Hamas. And we are here today to say to those women, we believe you and we support you. It is now my privilege to introduce our first speaker today, the second gentleman, Doug Emmerhoff. He is so generous to lend his time and voice to this issue but I do want to quickly note that he has a teaching commitment that will force him to quickly rush to his next obligation after he speaks with us. So I'm eternally, eternally grateful for his willingness to work this into his very busy schedule. This issue is a high priority for him and this White House. Even before October 7, Israel and the Jewish people had no better friend in the White House than President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Mr. Amhoff, the first Jewish spouse of an American president or vice president, has been a force in combating anti-Semitism at home and abroad. It has been inspiring to see him share his Jewish heritage and culture with the American people in his role as second gentleman. He's also served as a source of strength for the Jewish community as we grapple with astronomical, the astronomical rise in anti-Semitism. From traveling to Germany and Poland to commemorate the Holocaust, being instrumental in developing the United States' first ever national strategy to combat anti-Semitism, and reaching out behind the scenes to the owner of a Jewish-owned restaurant in Philadelphia after it was the target of anti-Semitic protests. Mr. Amhoff continues to be a force for good in our efforts to end Jewish hate. We are so proud to call him our second gentleman and know he is in our corner. Please join me in welcoming the second gentleman of the United States of America. It's hard to talk about this. It's hard to get up here and, and speak to you. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, uh, Congresswoman, to um, continue to speak up and speak out, and also to use your power to convene and work across the aisle on this issue and to convene uh, leaders from Congress, uh, leaders in civil society. I see a lot of advocates out there that we work with, and of course, the ambassador um, and his wife. I will stay to hear you, and then after the teach at Georgetown Law School after this, but um, this is tough stuff. And uh, it was tough before October 7th. As the Congresswoman mentioned, uh, we worked very hard, and we meaning the administration, along with Ambassador Lipstadt, to come up with a national strategy to combat anti-Semitism as part of the Biden-Harris's uh, administration's overall uh, fight against hate. Uh, there is an Islamophobia plan coming. That was already uh, in the works before October 7th. And so we, we all have to stand up against hate and barbarism and terrorism, wherever it raises its ugly head. And as Congresswoman said, us Jews, wherever we are, we're still coming to grips with what happened on October 7th, me included. Um, and I'm trying to do it as publicly as I can uh, to continue the work that this administration started uh, to fight hate uh, wherever it is. And we've seen the numbers 
since October 7th are astronomical. It's a, it's a crisis. And we saw another report that just came out yesterday. And so we must all be against this hate. And what we saw on October 7th in, in total, as you mentioned, the, the darkest day uh, for Jews since the Holocaust, the unimaginable violence, brutality, people, young people at a music festival, grand, grandmas, Holocaust survivors, little kids, and, and now and women. And the evidence is, is it's almost, uh, you can't even speak about it. Torture, genital mutilation, butchery, leaving women after they've been raped and tortured to die on the, in a ditch. All while you, you see the images of Hamas terrorists laughing and bragging about it. This happened. This happened to these women. This happened. We have to shine a light on it. We have to shine a light on this sexual violence, this gender-based violence that happened. As mentioned, the, the evidence is there from the lawyer. So you've got it. you cannot ignore the facts and the evidence when they're right in your face. Do not ignore it. You cannot deny it. And anyone who fails to acknowledge it, anyone who does deny it, must be called out. Must be called out. You see it, you gotta speak up. And if you're a leader and you don't speak up, it's even worse. You gotta call it out. You cannot sit idly by. The reports that I'm hearing, um, about the discrediting of first-hand accounts is simply a failure of justice. It cannot happen. Uh, they have to be heard. I have met with um, hostages who have been released. I have met with those families. These stories must be told. They cannot be ignored. This is never acceptable. It's, it's not acceptable on October 7th, and it's not acceptable whenever and wherever it happens in the world. Sexual violence, mutilation, torture, butchering is not an inevitable byproduct of war. It simply is not. As you'll probably hear from Ambassador Lipstadt, uh, this denialism where it exists, a lot of it is rooted in anti-Semitism, and she will discuss that more in her remarks, I'm sure. And that must be called out and addressed. There cannot be silence if it just happens to Jewish women and called out wherever it happens around the world. It's not acceptable. We must believe women. We cannot look away. We cannot ignore their pain. We must acknowledge it, like I said, whether it happens in Israel on 10-7 or wherever it happens. It all must be acknowledged. President and Vice President have been unequivocal in condemning these horrific acts. My wife, the Vice President, this is a lot of the work that she has done her whole career. Uh, one of the reasons she became a prosecutor was to protect women and children from violence. It's very personal to her and I want very important to her and the President. Um, we need to be able to clearly and unequivocally denounce this violence against women. No matter what your thoughts or feelings are about any other issue uh, that, that is happening uh, with this conflict, uh, there has been too much pain and loss on both sides of this conflict, Palestinians included, let's be clear. Um, we're, we're processing what's happening differently. There's been a lot of suffering. But we have to be clear about this. No matter what you're saying or feeling, this happened. This violence against women must be denounced and it must be condemned by everyone. It's important that we work together to bring peace, security, and dignity to Israeli people and Palestinian people. 
An important first step to creating peace and dignity is understanding and acknowledging the pain and suffering of everyone involved, including victims of sexual violence. We must continue to listen to all survivors and elevate their stories. We must believe them. We must honor them. This work takes all of us. We need to build coalitions. That's an integral part of our anti-Semitism strategy, and it's an integral part to fighting hate of all kinds. We all need to be in it together. We need to build coalitions. We need to have compassion. We need to listen to each other. But most of all, we've got to come together and fight injustice. We have to be against violence. We have to be against violence against women, and we have to call it out. We can't deny it. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much uh, to the second gentleman for his time. And uh, again, I'm just thank you uh, for you depart, which I know will be after the ambassador's uh, and Mrs. Kozak's remarks. I do want to quickly acknowledge uh, the, my colleagues who are here, some of whom we'll, we'll hear from and some of whom are here to, uh, to, to listen in. Um, we are, are joined by uh, Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici from Oregon, Susan Wilde from Pennsylvania, Lois Frankel from Florida, Grace Meng from New York, Gwen Moore, uh, who's been very involved in gender-based violence issues from Wisconsin, Kathy Manning from North Carolina, we were joined earlier by Brad Schneider from Illinois, Dan Goldman from New York, Marriott Miller-Meeks from Ohio, Claudia Tennant from New York, and Debbie Dingell from Michigan. I'm now honored to introduce Israel's ambassador to the United States, Michael Herzog, and his wife, Sharon Herzog. Prior to his appointment in 2021, Ambassador Herzog honorably served in the IDF, retiring with the rank of Brigadier General. During his tenure working for four ministers of defense, he served as senior military aide and later as chief of staff. Throughout his career, he has been integral to the Arab-Israeli peace process, serving as a peace negotiator and special emissary. I've had the privilege of working very closely with him during his distinguished tenure and greatly value his wisdom and insight on all issues related to Israel and the Middle East, and I am proud to call him a friend. And as you know, may know, uh, the ambassador's wife, as he said earlier, but I will say unequivocally, uh, she is accomplished an accomplished attorney in her own right. She is a leading lawyer in Israel who still practices and whose resume speaks for itself. Uh, she speaks and writes on Israeli legal and societal matters since October 7th. She has been active in supporting the hostage families and has made the issue of gender-based violence a priority and is one of the leading, uh, the key leaders who, uh, who I worked with to make sure that this, uh, that this briefing could happen. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador and Sharon Hussain. Good morning. I want to start by thanking Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schulz for hosting us. You're a force of nature, and I want to thank you, your team, and our team in the embassy headed by Ruti Koren for putting so much effort into this uh, important uh, event. And I want to thank the second gentleman, the members of Congress, uh, Ambassador Lipstadt, heads of women's organization, and all of you for joining us here today. We just had a closed session where we watched and heard Police testimonies about sexual abuse of women by Hamas on October 7th and since October 7th. It was terrible to watch and hear. It is hard to sleep quietly after you see what you see and hear what you hear. But when you do, you understand that you cannot interpret the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza solely through the prism of a geopolitical conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. This is deeper. This is about culture. This is about basic human values. This is about humanity. And when you understand that, you understand why Israelis' sense of security and the mental sense of security was shattered on October 7th, and why Israelis will no longer be willing to live with such a threat by evil terrorists, meters away, next door. American went, America went to war in Afghanistan following 9-11. That was thousands of miles away. Here we have terrorists living meters away from our homes. 
Israeli will no longer have it. In Jewish tradition, when you face a dramatic eruption, either something uh, awesome in the good sense or awful in the bad sense like this, there are two ways of responding. The first is by silence. We are silent in order to internalize, to fathom, to connect with our soul. But after we internalize, we have to speak up. We have to sound a loud voice. We have to shout. And every human being of decency must shout, must cry out, this cannot be. There is no context that can justify these evil atrocities. It is not dependent on context. It does not depend on context. This simply cannot be. And this is what this whole event is about, in order to sound that voice. Thank you. Good morning. This is an important event. I'd like to thank Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz and her team, as well as the team of the Israeli Embassy for putting it together. Thank you, second gentleman, for being here. Thank you to members of Congress and the other important participants. I speak here not only as an Israeli, but also as a mother and as a woman. Like many Israelis, I knew well a beautiful and kind-hearted young woman was murdered while attempting to escape the Nova Music Festival massacre on October 7. I would like to provide some context to what you are about to, see, to hear today, February 14, paradoxally, Valentine's Day. The abhorrent and dehumanizing sexual atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7, and since then, were systematic, premeditated, and shameless. What you're about to hear and what was presented earlier today at the closed session are extremely difficult to fathom. Presenting the evidence, whether by screening the Hamas footage or through the other testimonies, raised considerable dilemmas for us. Starting with the dignity of the victims, whose closest family members sometimes are not aware of what they have endured going to the protection and legal aspects of the, of the legal evidence and material. But it is important that the world will understand what we went through. What is presented today, as hard as it is, is only a fragment of the material. It doesn't include the most horrific and explicit evidence. Here with us is Dr. Nurna Naitan, the chair of the Division of Psychiatry, Tel Aviv Medical Center, who has dedicated herself to treating survivors of Hamas victims. Bearing witness to some of those heinous crimes for a couple of hours is horrific. This courageous woman, as her colleagues in Israel, have spent four months doing it. Imagine that. As we listen, let us only ask. Where are all the women's organizations? Where are their voices? Where are their actions? 134 hostages are still held captive in Gaza, including young women. In light of the sexual violence that Hamas has perpetrated on October 7, and since then, the parents of some of those women are concerned about the, the consequences of those actions. Some of them are concerned that their daughters may be pregnant. Think about this unthinkable situation. Time is of the essence. Bring them home, now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you again to the second gentleman who, uh, whose Georgetown Law students are, uh, are awaiting him. I I'm humbled to introduce our next speaker, and it's necessary because uh, those who have joined us need to understand your, uh, your role and your relevance. Dr. Renana Aitan, 
has practiced medicine for over 20 years and currently serves as chair of the psychiatric division at the Tel Aviv Swarovski Medical Center in Ikola. Previously, she served as the founding director of the Clinical and Research Neuropsychiatric Unit at the Hadassah Medical Center and as the founding director of the Jerusalem Mental Health Center's Research and Neuropsychiatry Unit. Since October 7th, she has been working extensively with hostages who were released from Gaza and with survivors of Hamas's sexual violence. She has become a critical voice in documenting the physical and psychological abuse suffered at the hands of Hamas. Thank you for all you're doing to treat and care for survivors, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Ritan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to address you today. As a psychiatrist, my task many times is to shed light where darkness prevails. Sharing with you the profound mental consequences of October 7th massacre in Israel, I bring forth not just stories of despair, but also those of resilience and hope. So I'm Renana Eitan, and I'm the Chair of Psychiatry at the Tel Aviv Medical Center, and I'm the Chair of the Israel Society of Biological Psychiatry. And on the morning of October 7th, as the missile alarm shattered the dawn, I was immediately aware that we were on the cusp of a crisis unlike any we had faced before. Soon after arriving to the hospital, I met men, women, children who survived tormented hours in sheltered places while the homes surrounding them were invaded, burned, and destroyed. I met young survivors of the music festival who wanted to celebrate youth and love only to be gunned down, and I met wounded brave soldiers, so many of them. Each of these survivors present with the scars of unspeakable violence. Their testimonies etched into the fabric of a terrible shared experience tell a story of survival and pain and the urgent need for help. I knew immediately that action must be taken so in response to the overwhelming need for emotional support, on October 10th, we established an emergency service to provide high quality mental first aid. Our mission was clear, to reach out to every survivor, to offer a sanctuary for their pain, and to start the healing process. By the end of November, our commitment had extended to treating those who endured captivity, witnessing firsthand the depth of human cruelty. Until now, hundreds of survivors have been treated by me and my staff at the Tel Aviv Medical Center. Combining data from our center with that of other hospitals, we found evidence of severe physical, mental, and sexual abuse. Those held captive were subjected to starvation, beating, and being held in inhumane sanitary conditions. Our work, rooted in the delicate practice of psychiatry care, was challenged like never before. The testimonies of those who suffered not only physical, but profound emotional and psychological trauma during the massacre and subsequent captivity under Hamas demanded a reevaluation of our approach to trauma care. The essence of our clinical reality trans transformed, guided to an obligation to listen, to bear witness, and to validate the experiences of those who suffered unimaginable horrors. This transformation was not without its complexities, the ethical considerations of confidentiality, and the potential for re-traumatization loomed large, challenging us to navigate the terrain with utmost sensitivity and respect to the survivor's dignity and privacy. Experience teaches us that many victims of sexual violence come forward to report the assault only after weeks, months, or even years. Some Holocaust survivors told their story of their sexual abuse as children only after many years, sometimes in the last decade of their lives. So, when meeting with survivors and hostages, we knew that this is critical to collect evidence as quickly as possible. Yet, we also knew that this approach does not allow the victims to reach the stage of processing the traumatic experience needed for sharing their experience in therapy or legally reporting of the crimes. You see, victims need more time. We must respect that. I stand before you today to tell you about those who chose to tell their story, a story of sexual abuse during the attack, as well as captivity, 
which is probably still ongoing for some of them. I'm here to give them a voice while respecting their privacy and well-being. It is important to note that specific details may vary, but reported forms of mental abuse inflicted by Hamas terrorists on victims and hostages include psychological torture, isolation, forced witness of violence, manipulation and indoctrination, threats and intimidation, um, or, and control of basic needs. And I will share some of the examples. Victims were often subjected to constant threats with weapons and psychological torture techniques aimed at, in, at instilling fear, anxiety, and helplessness. This includes threat to harm to themselves or their loved one, and threats to harm them even after they were released. The terrorists employ tactics such as verbal abuse, humiliation, and degradation to break down the hostages' sense of self-worth and dignity. This psychological torture made the hostages more vulnerable to other forms of physical and sexual abuse. Some of the hostages were isolated from external contact, including family and friends. This included the separation of family members, siblings, and children from their mothers. Some host hostages were held in solitary confinement and spent long days in total darkness until they developed severe hallucinations. This isolation can contribute to a sense of loneliness, despair, and a heightened vulnerability to psychological manipulation and sexual abuse. Many survivors who were held in isolation felt that their secrets would stay with them and would predict that it would take a long time for them to share any sexual trauma. Hostages were forced to witness or participate in violence acts, contributing to trauma and long-term psychological distress. Some of these acts were sexual abuse or exposure of young children to inappropriate sexual content. Hostages were subjected to ideological indoctrination. Some were forced to use psychiatric drugs and other substances. This can lead to distorted perception of reality and a profound impact on the individual's identity. Hostages had their basic needs, such as food, water, and sleep, manipulated and restricted contributing to a state of physical and mental exhaustion. Most of the survivors of the massacre and those who have experienced captivity exhibit symptoms consistent of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. These include painful traumatic memories, paralyzing fear, intrusive thoughts, difficulties falling asleep, and nightmares. Many survivors report hypervigilance, hypersensitivity to any sound or trigger that reminds them of the massacre or the time in captivity, emotional numbness, and negative alternations in mood. Many victims present severe dissociative states where for a moment they feel that as if they are still in captivity and only later do they return to the understanding that they have been released. Some present with cognitive difficulties including problems in concentration, memory, and decision-making. Most of the individuals present with survivor's guilt, feeling of guilt or shame for surviving or having been released from captivity, <coughs> while the friends and family members remain, uh, remain there. The psychological distress associated with terror and captivity led to the onset of depression in some of the individuals, characterized by sadness, hopelessness, a diminished sense of self-worth, preoccupation with death, <coughs> and thoughts of self-harm. Many of the survivors go through a grieving process for the death of family members and close friends in the Hamas terror attack. Some of the hostages realize the loss of their loved one only after returning to Israel, and they experience a range of emotions, including shock, denial, anger, guilt, and profound sadness. The sudden and violent nature of the terror attack exacerbated these emotions, making it even more difficult for individuals to cope. In conclusion, the October 7th survivor and the, and the individuals subjected to Hamas captivity experienced a range of mental health consequences, necessitating comprehensive mental health assessment, therapeutic intervention, and support for effective rehabilitation. This situation requires a new understanding and the creation of treatment protocols that will fit this reality. I have been a psychiatrist for over 20 years now, and I have never seen 
such human cruelty before. The severe, extreme, and continuous trauma results in unbearable emotional symptoms. Yet, during the treatment of his survivors, I also encountered hope, love, and tenderness. I witnessed sisters and brothers hugging in joy after reuniting. I saw elderly grandparents running to kiss their adult children. And I saw a nation coming together with great strength and a decision not to leave any survivor behind. As I conclude, I recall the words of Elie Wiesel, to forget the dead would be akin to kill them a second time. In sharing the stories of those who endured the October 7th massacre and its aftermath, we not only honor their experiences, but also commit for, to a future when such stories are no longer a reality. Thank you for your attention and for the intense, intense responsibility we share in bearing witness these stories, in advocating the comprehensive post-trauma care, and in working towards a world where the dignity and mental health of every individual is upheld. Despite the overwhelming cruelty we have witnessed, our faith in humanity remains unbroken. Together, we stand in solidarity with the survivors committed to rebuilding lives and fostering a future where such violence is relegated to the annals of history. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rattan. I, I hope that our participants and anyone hearing this, uh, this briefing are, are beginning to understand that the atrocities that Hamas committed were real and persistent and intentional, and that the world of advocates that traditionally fight gender-based violence need to acknowledge that and engage in the pushback and outrage that is so essential to making sure that it never happens again. I'm honored to introduce Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism at the Department of State. She has led the United States' efforts to counter anti-Semitism throughout the world and has made an insurmountable impact in the fight to combat anti-Semitism and uplift the Jewish community. She is also one of the key administration officials who crafted the first ever U.S. national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. As I mentioned in my opening remarks last month, Ambassador Lipstadt, Lipstadt published a powerful op-ed alongside a dear friend of mine, Michelle, Ambassador Michelle Taylor, uh, the U.S. Permanent Representative to the U.N. Human Rights Council, entitled, Israeli Women and Girls Have Suffered Horrific Sexual Violence from Hamas. Where is the outrage? I encourage everyone here to read their powerful message. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt. Thank you, Ambas um, Ambassador. <laughs> uh, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, my friend. Uh, thank you to your colleagues. Uh, the second gentleman has come and gone as a teacher. I understand that need to get to class, Ambassador Herzog, and my colleague from the State Department, Ambassador Gita Gupta, uh, uh, in, who is he heads the global women's issue and who's been such a partner in this effort um, and uh, of what happened on 10-7 particularly what we call the GBV, gender-based violence, which is a very antiseptic name for rape, torture, uh, and all sorts of other horrific acts. I stand before you today as a woman, as a Jew, and as a special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. And it's on the last category that I wish to focus. I also stand before you as someone who spent a good part of her academic career and uh, somewhat uh, in legal uh, trouble uh, on my work uh, as a Holocaust, uh, work, working exposing Holocaust denial. One of the things about Holocaust denial that Ambassador Taylor and I point out in the essay, in the op-ed, is that took about 15, 20 years to gain any traction at all. Here we saw denial of what happened, happening within a few days. Uh, before Israel had entered Gaza, before anything, uh, immediate denial. Um, e and, e den and then it continued even after there was a great deal of evidence. Uh, people said, well, there's not enough evidence. We have to hear from the others. Uh, what happened to the slogan the, and the much 
heralded, many of us heralded it, slogan of and, and watchword motto of the Me Too movement, believe the women. Um, when the tragedies, the horrific tragedies of Boko Haram happened, when the tragedies of the Yazidi women happened, even the tragedies of the Iranian women, one was murdered, certainly, but most were, were, were uh, abused because they took off their headscarves. We spoke out, the world spoke out, in unison the world spoke out without equivocation. And yet here there was silence. As one feminist scholar has pointed out, there is gender-based violence that is a consequence of war. That doesn't make it right, but it happens. And there is gender-based violence that is a policy of war. And what we saw here, and in the 24, I, I believe it is, places in which Hamas came into uh, Israel across the border, uh, we saw similar kinds of acts. This was not random. It may have differed in certain places, but it was not random. It was designed, as some of others have already said today, to humiliate, to debase, to harm uh, women, and now we have learned in certain cases and the hostages, men as well. Uh, but when, when there was such an, a quick, swift, as there should have been response to Boko Haram, to the Yazidis, the Iranian women, we asked, Ambassador Taylor and I asked, Manish Tana, what's different here? And the only difference we could perceive was the perception, it wasn't the case, the perception that all the victims were Jews. In fact, some of the victims were non-Jews, some were Druze, some were Muslim, uh, some were uh, others, but the perception was that these were all uh, Jews. Um, silence is bad. It's always bad in the face of tragedies. <coughs> but silence from those who proclaim to be advocates for human rights. Silence for those who claim to be fierce defenders of women. Silence from those who take upon themselves the, the responsibility to speak out when there is suffering. That is a different kind of silence. That is a silence that speaks to their very credibility. And that is the silence that is so deafening to many of us in this room who have made so much of our lives, have dedicated so much of our lives to these movements. The, the silence is deafening, uh, the, their credibility is on the line and continues to be. Um, and we in, in, my, in the State Department who deal particularly with anti-Semitism say that the only difference we can find here is that the perception that these were Jewish women and that translates into anti-Semitism. Thank you very much. I do want to acknowledge, um, as Ambassador Lipstadt did, uh, Raul Gupta, the Ambassador of the Office of Global Women's Issues, as well as uh, Danielle Ofek, who is the founder of the organization Me Too, Unless You're a Jew, which is the, uh, has been a, a poignant and, and urgent voice since October 7th to underscore and highlight the very issues that we're talking about here today. I am now uh, really thrilled to be able to introduce um, and acknowledge a dear friend um, who I don't need paper to, uh, to introduce uh, because we've known each other as, for so many years. But Lois Frankel, my colleague and friend, is a long time, lifelong and fierce defender of Israel, a longstanding champion for women and girls. She became the first woman ever elected Democratic leader in the Florida State Legislature. Here in the U.S. House, Congresswoman Frankel now serves as the chair of the Democratic Women's Caucus, a coalition dedicated to the empowerment of women's voices. Since the October 7th attacks on Israel, she has used her voice to condemn Hamas's sexual violence against women, including by authoring a bipartisan resolution that will be considered on the House floor this week. Congresswoman Frankel has been a mentor, friend, and ally for quite literally since the beginning of my public service. Thank you for joining us, my dear friend. Thank you. And I just have to say, I, I went from being a mentor to being mentored. <laughs> 
Thank you, Representative Wasserman Schultz, and my colleagues, former colleagues, all the ambassadors and the civil society leaders that are here today and everybody who's uh, with us. Um, I'm here really not just as a member, but as a mother and as a grandmother. And I think all of us are here in that capacity in some way. Uh, you know, we've heard, we mark 131 days since October 7th when the Hamas terrorists attacked Israel, mercifully killed 1,200 people, tortured and maimed thousands of others, and took 240 hostages. War is never nice. But some actions in war are so awful and so devoid of humanity that they are considered crimes. Hamas terrorists raped, mutilated, burned, assaulted their victims to inflict psychological and physical pain, unleashing trauma that continues to plague a very grieving population. Raz Cohn was a survivor. This is, in his own words, what he witnessed. Five men came out of a van and captured a woman, ripping off her clothes, and they formed a circle around her, and one raped her and killed her with a knife, and then he raped her again, and the men, they didn't seem angry. They just laughed. They thought it was fun. They murdered a lot of people for fun. I still remember her voice, Roz said, screams without words. Roz's story is just one account of widespread, unimaginable crimes of Hamas committed against Israelis. A number of us met recently with the parents of two young women, 19 and 20 years old, both musicians, full of life, with dreams and aspirations, who are still being held captive, most likely in the dark caves of Hamas in Gaza. And they, alongside 20 other young women, are feared. Well, we don't want to, it's even hard to talk about the fear of what's happening to these young women. We know they are in tunnels, most likely where the air and food are scarce, and the abuse is abundant. 131 days of this, uh, and you could just imagine or don't want to imagine the emotional torture of their parents and families. And as our ambassador just said, shockingly and alarmingly, Hamas brutal violence has been met with a shrug, just a shrug from corner, many corners of the world, even people denying their violence. And we know sexual violence has been used as a weapon of war throughout history around to terrorize and, and humiliate victims. But that doesn't make it okay. And we must make it clear that sexual violence is a crime against humanity and must never be used or accepted as a weapon of war. So I am in a very divided house. There's sometimes something I can say that's good. Uh, today, at, I'm going to give you the time if you want to come to the floor at 3.45 p.m. today. The House will consider a bipartisan resolution condemning Hamas despicable acts of rape and sexual violence in its war against Israel. I want to tell you that the Speaker of the House, the Majority Office, our Minority Office, all intervened to get this bill of this resolution on the floor. It has 200 co-sponsors, Republicans and Democrats, across all philosophical events. <laughs> we got the most, we got the people on the left and the people on the right and, and with one vo voice. Uh, I thank uh, Kathy Manning, where are you? Are you still here, Kathy? She had to step out. She'll be managing the bill. She's one of the prime co-sponsors and I'm going to give a shout out to the Republican Prime co-sponsors, Mario Diaz-Balart and, and Jen Kiggins. 
The resolution condemns all rape and sexual violence as weapons of war, including those acts committed by Hamas. It calls on nations to criminalize rape and sexual assault. It calls on all interna international bodies to condemn Hamas barbaric actions, and it reaffirms our support for independent investigations of rape and sexual violence committed by Hamas and refer, reaffirms our commitment to supporting survivors of rape and sexual violence. This is not a one and done. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the Women, Peace and Security Caucus will kick off, uh, our, uh, have our kickoff event. The focus is going to be on sexual violence. And I will say thank uh, Ambassador Gupta, who has a commitment that we will be working on this issue domestically and internationally. And uh, we're going to continue to be heard on this issue. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Congresswoman Frankel. You've been a fierce advocate for women uh, for your entire career and it continues to this day. It's now my pleasure to introduce Noah Tishby, a New York Times best-selling author and the former uh, special envoy to combat anti-Semitism um, in Israel. Uh, she's also the best-selling author of the book, which I have read, Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth, and a leading voice for the state of Israel and the rights of women worldwide. I was proud to have her testify in 2022 at a hearing of the Interparliamentary Task Force to Combat Online Anti-Semitism, for which I serve as a co-chair about the international prolifer proliferation of anti-Semitism on social media platforms. Since the attacks on October 7th, Noah has continued her fierce activism for Israel and for the release of the hostages that remain held in Gaza. She has been pivotal in highlighting the atrocities committed by Hamas and combating anti-Semitism on college campuses. Noah, welcome back to the United States. Thank you, Congresswoman Frankel. Thank you so much for having me, Congresswoman Councilman Schultz, Ambassador Shireen, Ambassador Lipstad, distinguished members. Rape, vaginal mutilation, shooting a woman while she's being raped. These were not an incidental aspect of this brutal attack Hamas perpetrated against Israel on October 7th. They were at the very core of that attack. Everywhere Hamas carried out massacres, they also carried out violence against women and girls, so gruesome, so sadistic that the words rape or sexual violence do not capture the true scale of the horror. These rapes were not spontaneous, they were planned, they were calculated, in fact, they were a priority. You see, for jihadi groups like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like ISIS, and all the rest, women are not equal to men. They are property of men, to be owned by men, without power, without control, and if she does something deemed disrespectful to a man or to the family, like walking down the street with any other man, without the right to life. Hamas had a twisted logic for these systematic gang rapes. They wanted to claim ownership of Israeli women and girls. Ownership. You see, in a conflict involving a motherland, Hamas was trying to make a point. If we own your mothers, your sisters, and your daughters, then we will own you, and we will own your land. So these jihadi psychopaths invaded Israel with specific orders to rape, defile, and disfigure as many women and girls as possible. In their interrogations, captured Hamas terrorists calmly share their orders to soil the women. They gang raped women to death. They shot them in the head while they were raping them. They stabbed and shot them while raping them. They raped them next to the bodies of those that they already slaughtered. They cut their breasts off. First responders, they found bodies with nails driven inside women's vaginas. Hamas is the political manifestation of rape culture. 
and the silence, the silence of those who are usually quick to defend other women, but had nothing to say about one of the most barbaric systematic attacks on women ever carried out is deafening, and I beg you to give me any other explanation for this silence other than me too, unless you are a Jew. Then there were those who uh, celebrated these systematic rapes as resistance and decolonization. Even as the evidence and testimonies became crystal clear, we heard nothing from them but lies, denials, and deflections. We should be disgusted by those who make excuses for jihadi rapists, because that is who your Hamas freedom fighters are. They're not a resistance movement. They are a rape cult. But the Hamas apologists and the uh, From the River to the Sea crowd admits the truth then the game is up. Then we know that when they say by any means necessary, that includes the rape and murder of women and girls. Rape is not resistance. There is only resisting rape. Then there are those who, uh, who were took hostage. Um, like Naama Levy, <clears throat> filmed by Hamas in her bloodied sweatpants being manhandled into a jeep. Naama is a teenager. She's a teenager, she's a young peace activist, still held hostage, as are another 17 women, including four other teenage girls. We've heard the testimonies of what's happening to them. We don't want to think about it, but we have to. And we have to bring them home now. Thank you. Hamas hates women and it hates Jews. And in Hamas' sick worldview, when you rape a woman, you own her. So they wanted to soil us, they wanted to terrorize us, and they wanted to own us. In Gaza, Hamas obliterates women from public life by deciding for them where, what they can wear, where they can go, and who they can go there with. At the Nova Festival, free and empowered young Israeli women were doing what they wanted. They dressed and danced however they wanted with whoever they wanted, and Hamas paraglided into that festival to obliterate them by destroying their faces and their bodies. But Israeli women, Jewish women, we will not be owned and we will not be obliterated. We are warriors, tank commanders, survivors, we will not be silenced, not by jihadi death cult, and not by its supporters. Thank you. The people of Israel live. The women of Israel live. Am Israel Chaya. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. We're also members of Congress, members of the Knesset, and as we say here in the United States Capitol, I associate myself with the gentlelady's remarks. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Susan Wild from Pennsylvania. In 2018, Representative Wild became the first woman ever elected to represent her seat in Congress, and now she sits as the ranking member, which is the lead Democrat of the House Committee on Ethics, a powerful advocate for survivors of domestic violence and a relentless champion for women's empowerment. Representative Wilde's dedication to combating gender-based violence is unmatched. Last Congress, she authored a resolution which recognized sexual violence against girls as a serious global issue and encouraged international reforms to protect young women and girls from abuse. My friend and colleague, welcome. Thank you. I speak to you as the mother of a young woman um, a young Jewish woman who has been to Israel multiple times and who I could easily envision having been at the music festival. It's something she would have done if she were there. And as I have on multiple occasions now seen videos and pictures of what transpired that day, my thoughts consistently go back to my daughter. And I can't help but think of how such horror would have destroyed our, our family, without any question. And so 
we always have to also remember that in addition to the victims, the, the families of all of these people are victims as well. I am so glad that we are having this session today, um, and I thank the witnesses who have testified um, before members of Congress, before um, the National Council of Jewish Women at the UN, um, and in multiple other places. I know that it has been incredibly hard for them, um, and it re-traumatizes, I'm sure, but it's just so incredibly important. Thank you to my good friend, Representative Wasserman Schultz for convening this. Thank you to the second gentleman and to Ambassador and Mrs. Herzog for being here. And I want to give a special thanks to all of my colleagues who are very committed to exposing this horror. We are here today to bear witness. We are here to affirm our indignation and to call on the international community to unequivocally speak out against the atrocities that were perpetrated on October 7th and most specifically, the horrific acts of sexual violence against women. The unbearable pain of these events has been compounded by the collective silence, the equivocation, the denial, or even justification with which they have been met in far too many instances. I attended the session at the United States Nations in New York recently that was organized by the National Council of Jewish women to draw attention to the fact that the UN and so many other organizations have ignored the violence against women that occurred on October 7th. Apparently, we are going to continue to need to bring attention to this horrific issue that apparently others are willing to ignore, or even worse, to deny or justify. I am committed to working with all of my colleagues here in Congress to amplify your voices, the voices of Israelis and specifically Israeli women and the other women victims, and has, has, has been noted, not all of them were Israelis, and to express our collective indignation and to work toward some degree of justice and accountability, whatever that looks like. It's hard to even use those words because it's hard to imagine justice or accountability for these horrific actions. With that, I want to introduce the outstanding CEO of the National Council of Jewish Women, Sheila Katz. Sheila has shown powerful moral leadership on these issues as well as on issues affecting communities across our country. And Sheila, with that, I will turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're here today to make sure the voices of victims of sexual violence are heard. That the final screams of the women assaulted and then killed by Hamas terrorists on October 7th in Israel are heard. That the cries from the women assaulted still by Hamas terrorists while being held captive in Gaza are heard. We are here today to bear witness. We are here today to tell the survivors of sexual assault on October 7th that we believe them and it's not their fault. We are here today to tell those still held hostage in Gaza that we believe them and are fighting for their return. And we are here today to speak out to ensure no other woman will be subjected to the violence they experienced. We are here today to call out rape as a tool of war. I spent most of my career in education and served as a rape crisis counselor in my decade plus career with Hillel on college campuses and working with students. I sat in the same hospital room while many received rape kits, trying to give them dignity in a process that is less than dignifying. I sat on the floor of their college dorm rooms, listening to what happened to them, what was taken from them. I told them, I believe you, it's not your fault. 
I've been with hundreds of survivors on their journeys to move from victim to advocate, ultimately on a lifelong journey to healing. Rape is a violation against humanity. We must not allow sexual assault to be normalized in any form, not on our college campuses, not in our streets of our cities, not when it is used as a tool of war. Rape must never be justified. When Hamas terrorists infiltrated Israel four months ago on October 7th, they intentionally used rape in their arsenal of terror. Israeli women and girls were tortured, raped, and killed forever silenced by Hamas. When evidence emerged indicating the, of the use of rape as a weapon of war by Hamas, the voices we expected to speak up fell into the loudest silence we could have imagined. But silence normalizes rape. And in this case, it normalizes sexual assault as a weapon of war. The truth is, we have a decision to make. Either rape is always unacceptable or it isn't. Either all women are believed or they aren't. Either we condemn rape as a weapon of war or we normalize it. Every person and every member of Congress has an obligation to raise their voice to make clear that rape cannot be tolerated. Not just women, and not just women members of Congress, not just Jews, and not just Jewish members of Congress, but everyone. It shouldn't be a hard thing to say. I wish I could sit with the women who were assaulted and silenced by Hamas and tell them that we heard their cries, that the final moments of their lives would not define them, that we would work every day to make sure this never happened to anyone again. I wish they could hear us advocating on their behalf today. In Jewish tradition, when someone dies, we say, Zichrono Livracha, may their memory be for a blessing. But in 2019, during an epidemic of domestic violence in Israel, Israeli feminists began to say something else. Zichrona Lema'apacha, may her memory be for a revolution. The way we honor the women Hamas silenced is by speaking louder, demanding more, and ensuring rape is never tolerated, debated, or used as a weapon of war again. Let this be the revolution they inspire. Thank you. Sheila, thank you for those powerful words. Um, a revolution is, uh, is what needs to continue, and that was ignited and will continue. I want to acknowledge and thank for joining us my colleague and friend, Congresswoman Sheila Chapelis McCormick, my, my, my neighbor just to the east uh, in Broward County, and, uh, and our dear friend, many of our former colleague, Congresswoman Ilya Anabas Leitman, mi hermana de, mi, de Miami, and the former chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee here in the House of Representatives. Thank you both for joining us. Next, I'm proud to introduce a colleague and friend, I have many, uh, <laughs> Kathy Manning from North Carolina. Kathy is a fierce defender of Israel and the Jewish community. She serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and is the co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism. She was the first woman national president of the Jewish Federations of North America. And through her work on the task force and on the House Education and Workforce Committee, she's leading efforts to combat anti-Semitism in K through 12 schools and our institutions of higher education. Kathy, thank you. Also, the first Jewish person ever elected to Congress from the state of North Carolina. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today to hear the terrible truth of what Israeli women went through on October 7th. Uh, as Debbie said, I'm Congresswoman Kathy Manning. I represent North Carolina's 6th Congressional District, and I want to thank my dear friend, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, for her leadership in bringing 
uh, so many people together to discuss such a critically important issue. You are a force of nature <laughs> to have to brought us all together. Um, I also want to thank uh, the second gentleman, Emhoff. He is he is really become the face of so many important issues to the Jewish community. We're grateful to him. And of course, I want to thank Ambassador Inshir and Herzog. You are doing such outstanding work during such difficult times, and we are so thrilled that you're here with us. I want to thank all of my colleagues, my other uh, members of Congress who are here, our wonderful ambassador uh, to combat anti-Semitism. And I just want to give a shout out to Sheila Katz. I knew Sheila during her first, when she was in her first job at North Carolina Hill, and I take credit for everything she is today. So later today, I will be managing a debate on the House floor for a critical bipartisan resolution led by my dear friend, Congresswoman Lois Frankel, to condemn sexual violence perpetrated. On Hamas, uh, by Hamas on October 7th. And we all know what happened, uh, that Hamas uh, committed a horrific uh, terrorist assault on Israel, going house to house, murdering civilians, executing parents in front of children, massacring hundreds of young people at a music festival. They killed 1,200 uh, Israelis that day. They took uh, more than 250 innocent civilians uh, and are <coughs> hostage in Gaza, including women and children. But we only are beginning to understand the full scale of the horrific sexual violence that Hamas used as a weapon of war against Israeli women and girls in their attacks. And just this morning, uh, I was privileged to hear um, firsthand testimonies and um, see the evidence of what happened on that day, the deliberate, uh, horrific violence um, that's almost unspeakable in its brutality. Uh, women who were savagely captured, brutalized, raped, bodies left bloodied, violated, burned, mutilated. Um, the things that they did to women of all ages uh, are really beyond anything that you could or would want to imagine. Um, barbaric, horrific, absolute evil. And this weaponized sexual violence should shock the conscience of the entire world. And yet, despite all evidence, some have minimized or outright denied that Hamas used rape as a weapon of war on October 7th. In fact, I was chased outside my local airport by a woman who told me it was all propaganda. None of it ever happened. The collective silence from groups around the world who purport to stand up for women's rights has been devastating to Israel but also to the American Jewish community. The, um, the Israeli public is in trauma, and the American Jewish community is in trauma. Groups, including the UN Women, which took months to issue a statement clearly condemning the despicable acts of evil, are shameful. Their silence is absolutely inexcusable. So we're here today because we cannot and will not allow these horrific crimes to be denied or covered up. We must confront the terrible reality of what Hamas did and the trauma that they inflicted, not just on the women who were brutalized and killed, but all people who care about what happens in, in, to others because of a sense of shared humanity. We remain deeply concerned about the women who are still among the hostages. This House and this Congress must continue to do everything we can to get those hostages free. And let me just say, I think about the hostages every day, every single day. I have met with their families so often, I think of them as my own families. I have listened to their stories, their fears, especially the families of girls who are being held hostage. 
So we must continue to speak out. We must continue to talk, as difficult as it is, about the grotesque atrocities that took place and that we fear are still taking place. And we will not stay silent until the world acknowledges what happened to Israelis, Israeli women and girls, and until they understand that it is still happening, until we welcome the hostages back home to their families and to all of us, because we are all their families. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Kathy. Next, I'd like to introduce Meredith Jacobs, an award-winning journalist, former editor-in-chief of Washington Jewish Week and CEO of Jewish Women International. Meredith's leadership and tireless dedication to advancing the rights and well-being of Jewish women has left an undeniable impact on our community. Uh, I was proud to be on the cover of Jewish Women magazine uh, just before I was sworn into the U.S. House of Representatives. That's on my wall in my district office. She's the founder of the first Jewish parenting website known as ModernJewishMom.com, which I definitely should could have used when my children were younger. I might, might still be able to use it. And since assuming the role of CEO of JWI in 2020, she's led countless initiatives focused on empowering women and countering gender-based violence. Meredith, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. The members of Congress, Madam Ambassador, Ambassador Mrs. Herzog, and to Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, I thank you for your leadership. And I want to begin by echoing loudly how you began today. I believe Israeli women. I knew I would be going towards the end of the conversation. And so I didn't want to repeat what I knew you would be hearing. So I plan to use my remarks to offer some possible suggestions for how we might respond. But I want to begin by saying that when you intentionally rape, murder, and mutilate women and girls, you plot to destroy the future of a people. In December, Dr. Kohav el Kayam Levy, chair of Israel's Civil Commission on October 7 crimes, was assured by administration officials of the U.S. commitment <coughs> to exercising all financial, diplomatic, and legal tools to address sexual violence and conflict, including holding Hamas accountable. It is time to put the words into action. Hamas ordered sexual violence to be used as terrorism. There were U.S. citizens among the victims and hostages. Therefore, we ask Congress to urge the Department of Justice to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law those over whom the U.S. courts have jurisdiction, who aided, sanctioned, or abetted the use of sexual violence as a weapon of terrorism. Sexual violence was used everywhere the Hamas terrorists struck. It was designed to terrorize and traumatize the Israeli public it is not only the survivors who need to heal, it is all of Israel. The rape crisis centers and counseling agencies are overwhelmed and under-resourced. They need our support to deal with the unspeakable trauma that an entire country is experiencing. Therefore, we ask Congress to earmark funds for rape crisis centers and trauma treatment centers that exist and must be expanded in Israel. We heard about the unspeakable horrors that are being inflicted upon the hostages. And we understand from some who have been released that Hamas also tells them over and over and over again that the world has forgotten them, that the world does not care about them. And what is so horrible in this moment 
is that in a way the captors are right. The world has moved from silence to denial. Online disinformation campaigns denying that the rape occurred, dismissing facts as Zionist propaganda, prove the world has not only forgotten, but that it does not care. These campaigns invalidate and deny the humanity of Israeli women, the victims and the survivors, and the horrific atrocities they endured and are enduring. What is happening online is dangerous and lethal. In normal circumstances, survivors of sexual violence are shunned and shamed. The survivors of October 7th, what they are experiencing from this global campaign of distortion is unimaginable and will silence them. So just as we cry out against those who would not speak up, we must now fight against those who intentionally spread lies and hate. And therefore, we call on Congress to hold social media platforms accountable to implement and enforce policies against violent event denial and anti-Semitism. Even further, we encourage the creation of a bipartisan, bicameral working group that includes civil society organizations, academics, advocates, and the administration to develop recommendations for changes to federal law to counter disinformation consistent with the First Amendment. If we learned anything from the Holocaust, it is that the world forgets and the world denies. We cannot allow what happened, what is happening, to be erased. For all the women who died, for all the women who will survive, we cannot, must not, let what happened to them be forgotten, ever. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Rhoda Smolo, current National Assembly training co-chair and immediate past national president of Adassa, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. Under her leadership as the 27th president of Hadassah and her more than 44 years of membership in the organization, Rhoda has led Hadassah toward its goals of advocating for Jewish individuals, combating anti-Semitism, and championing women's health. We are truly fortunate to have a lifelong ally and advocate with us here today for such an important conversation. Rhoda, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Schultz. And I'd like to recognize Ambassador Herzog and Shereen Herzog and Ambassador Lipstadt. Before I start my remarks, I, I'm having this feeling, and I want to express it for all of you. I commented that I loved Congresswoman's jacket which has hearts on it because it's Valentine's Day. And in the morning, earlier today, we had a private session where we saw horrific video and pictures of what really happened to the women in Israel on October 7th. And what happened to me is that when I looked at the jacket, I think now of the word heartless. And I wore red for Valentine's Day because it is Valentine's Day, although I'm not home with my husband and family. But I, I keep thinking of heartless, and I keep thinking of the terrorists who were heartless and mutilated and raped and killed those innocent victims, Israeli women. And I think about the people in the world who are heartless because they are denying that it happened because we are Jewish and because we really don't matter. And I think about everyone in the United States and around the world who understand what they're going through but will not speak up because they're afraid. And I admire the people who are speaking up here in Congress and around the world who are taking the bold step to speak up because if we don't, who are we? And how can we accept the fact that we accept heartless people? I'm hoping that the condition called heartless is not going to spread. And I hope that there are cures for that. And people understand that if it can happen in Israel, it can happen anywhere else. These heartless people are around the world and we need to be an example to everyone else that we have to defeat the heartless people and make the world a better place so we can look at hearts and celebrate. Thank you, Congresswoman Schultz. I want to tell you that Hadassah was founded 112 years ago to bring health care and healing to pre-state Israel. 
We are now a global movement as the largest Jewish women's organization in the U.S., with over 300,000 supporters hailing from every congressional district in the country and an international presence in 18 countries. We have a major healthcare system in Israel with two world-class hospital campuses in Jerusalem, which also includes a rape crisis center and youth villages supporting and integrating at-risk children in Israel. On that day, October 7th, when most of you were in your homes waking up to the news of the Hamas attacks, but I was on a plane traveling to Israel for a special event. Little did anyone on that plane know that we were flying in at the moment that a war had started. I was nervous, I was anxious, but I knew that I had to do something right away. Thinking how Hadassah would play a role on the ground in this horrifying crisis and what would be needed to respond. I went directly to the hospitals. How could I help? And my mission became very obvious. I went to see the wounded as they came into the hospital. I held their hands by their bedside, telling them that they were receiving the best care, watching as the nurses in the hospital spent 10 minutes every hour to patients whose names they didn't know and had no one to be there with them. Understanding how devastating these wounds were, some would survive and some would die, but they needed to hear our voices. And I spent time in the hospital understanding that that's what we do. And I was there representing my membership from around the world. Dr. Hadassah's Bat Amin Center for Victims of Sexual Abuse said that their years of experience they had never imagined or seen this kind of brutal sexual violence. Rape should never be sanctioned as an act of war, not in Israel, not in Gaza, not in the Ukraine, Ethiopia, Rwanda, not anywhere, and not again. And we must stop this. We must hold Hamas accountable, and we must end the silence and speak the truth. That is why Hadassah continues to speak out. In October, we spoke out. Can I <coughs> I don't care. Oh, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. In October, Hadassah spoke out, implore, excuse me, imploring the UN and UN women acknowledge these horrible war crimes and condemn Hamas. We co-sponsored the Israeli mission to the UN's event to bring evidence and testimony about Hadassah's, about Hamas's gender-based violence directly to the United Nations. But did they hear us? Not yet. We led a joint letter with support from over 80 organizations, including the National Council of Jewish Women and Jewish Women International, who are here with us today, demanding that the UN conduct an independent, trauma-informed, unbiased investigation into these crimes and to pursue justice for all of the victims. We have mobilized our grassroots around the U.S. to support the critical efforts of Congress women and men who are trying to pass a bipartisan resolution in Congress to condemn Hamas on sexual violence, and I think, as we heard, it's happening today. And now we invite all of you to join us in our new End the Silence campaign. We are having a soft launch today, right now. You can go to go.hadassah.org slash end it. That's go.hadassah.org slash end it. And sign our petition to UN Secretary General that calls for the UN to speak out against these war crimes, pursue an independent investigation, and seek justice for the victims. This campaign will begin rolling out today and will be more public in the near future. We applaud the work of the IDF, the Civil Commission in Israel, and others to document and record these atrocities as they happened. Documentation is also a critical step toward pursuing justice, and we are committed to helping however we can. I have been to Israel every month since October 7, and I've brought people there in solidarity with Israel. And we went down to the kibbutzim that were attacked, and we saw the devastation. And we saw the devastation where the rock concert was happening. And let me tell you, every one of you should go down and see it for yourself. Videos and everything cannot show you what you can see in person. And bring everyone you know so that you can stop the silence. We thank all of you in Congress and the administration and fellow organizational leaders for your continued efforts to raise awareness and end the silence. When we denounce rape as a weapon of war, and we demand the hostages be released, when we call these acts what they are, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, we are validating the evidence and building a strong case for justice and accountability, and ensuring the victims of these atrocities are not erased. To quote Ambassador Lissette from an article in The Guardian, the use of sexual violence as a tool of war is undeniably on the rise. 
ignoring or delaying a response to credible reports of such horrific acts inadvertently validates the acts. It not only denies justice to the victims, but also emboldens the perpetrators. This fight transcends borders and cultural divides. In recognizing the horrific experience of Israeli women, we also need to magnify and acknowledge that Palestinian women and girls are victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Rape and mutilation of women are never acceptable. There is no but when it concerns gender-based violence. The use for sexual violence and conflict to coerce, terrorize, so fear, or for any other reason is no exception. This is something on which we must all agree, regardless of our position on the border conflict. I invite you to join Hadassah in the end of the silence campaign. Together, our voices can make a difference. No, not could make a difference, must make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhoda. I want to underscore the point that Rhoda made, that there is no asterisk next to gender-based violence against Jewish and Israeli women. No exception. No me too, unless you're a Jew. I'd like to invite my colleague and one of my closest friends in the Congress, a classmate of mine who I was proud to uh, be elected in the class of 2004 with, who has been here the entire time, and that's because she is personally and passionately committed to fighting and leading against gender-based violence. My colleague and friend, the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Gwen Moore. We cannot be silent about sexual violence. And the main reason we cannot be silent about sexual violence is because the perpetrators rely on your silence in order to continue to promote their evil. This has been my experience as a child, as a young woman, as an adult who has survived rape, violent rape, rape with my gun to, uh, to my head. I know that they depend on their silence. And your silence is part of the violence. The denial, I'm here today because I have definitely heard of people who do not believe that this has happened. And I believe the women, even though I have not seen those atrocious videos, I believe the women because it is too horrible to even imagine being raped, much less to, to lie about it. Let me just say this. The use of rape as a war weapon has become exponentially greater over time. And it's something that we all have got to do something about because it's not just these Israeli women. It is happening all of the time everywhere. And I just want to say that I'm joining the movement to end the silence because ending the silence is where we find the power. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gwen, for, uh, for joining us and for your powerful words. We do have, uh, and thank you to everyone for participating. Uh, before um, we conclude, I do want to make sure, because somehow I seem to always forget, but it's critical that I thank my remarkable staff uh, who helped us lead and pull together this event, Samantha Price, my legislative director, Tracy Pugh, my chief of staff, and the entire team that without whom this wouldn't be possible. I want to I want to just start by opening with a question and I think we probably have about 15 minutes that we can engage in some Q&A. Um, and Sharon, I, I if you don't mind I want to direct a question to you. Um, and then, you know, anyone else you know feel free to jump in. One one of the more horrific statements from Hamas sympathizers that followed and circulated October 7th was that all Israeli citizens, including women, 
are invading colonialists and thus are not civilians. So leave us, leaving aside the fact that this argument tacitly endorses rape being employed as a weapon of war, what does it mean to deny Israeli women's personhood on the basis of where they live, on the basis of who they are? And, and how can we combat false narratives that seek to conflate real or imagined wrongs by Israel's government with justification for raping Jewish women? And what does it mean to you to believe all women? And is there anyone in, in your observation that is exemplifying that well right now? I know that's a lot. But. <laughs> you said we have only 15 minutes, right? <laughs> well, this covers many things. I think um, as far as education, as far as people, people first of all need to know what has happened, what we saw in the closed session was really unimaginable and, uh, and this, is, this cannot be shared with other people because this is privacy of the victims, privacy of their family members, uh, the evidence for uh, legal procedures, etc. But I think uh, awareness, disclosure of what has happened, uh, testimonies, uh, shared support from our colleagues, uh, this will be helpful, and I think uh, rape cannot be justified under any circumstance. And this is a separate issue of whatever your view is about Israel's political situation. On October 6th, we had a ceasefire. We were not, we, we left Gaza, and I do not want to make this a political discussion or geopolitical discussion, but let's, let's keep it on a personal, women, rape, victimhood, and, and shared future for, our, for ourselves as a society. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much. I, because our, our remarks were so powerful and intense, we wanted to make sure that we didn't cut anyone short. Um, unfortunately, that's going to make it so that our conversation is somewhat cut short. But um, I wanted to just ask if there's anyone it would be hard to, for me to think of what else there might be to add, but um, is there anyone that has a question or would like to add uh, anything to the discussion? Noah? Yeah, there's uh, something I want to add quickly, um, and that is that we need to differentiate the two things have occurred. There were the atrocities of October 7th, and then there were the atrocities of October 8th. And the atrocities of October 8th were the protests and the silence. And the reason that I specifically say that it's October 8th is because October 8th was before Israel retaliated, before Israel defended itself, before Israel took one single action. The world was quick to conclude that there is a context, that there is a reason, that there's this another side to the story, that there's, you know, that there's an equivocation on any kind of level, and there isn't. The October 7th attacks are not only uh, geopolitical, as you said, they're not about borders or land, they're about values and everything that we hold dear. It's about religion, and it is, yes, it's about gender as well. So we need to understand that what happened on October 7th is not just against Israeli women and not just against Israel, it's literally against every single value that we appreciate and hold dear here in America and around Western world. Thank you. Ambassador Lipstadt? Yes, just to echo uh, what uh, Noah Tishby just said, uh, last week I was in conversation with the Attorney General of Australia, uh, and we were talking about the protest in, the, in front of the Sydney Opera House where people chanted and held signs saying, gas the Jews. When I cited that, he said to me, and that was on October 9th, maybe it was the 10th, but it was long before anything else had happened. So if you want examples of anti-Semitism, you can look there. You can see here the cry, globalize the intifada. It's an example of ants. Because what does that mean? Attack Jews. Uh, synagogues attacked. Rest, Jewish restaurants attacked. Jew, uh, Jews wearing anything, but making them identifiably Jewish uh, attacked. That's not being pro-Palestinian. That's not even being pro-Hamas. Unless, of course, you recognize Hamas is riddled with uh, anti-Semitism and all its documents and everything else. That's anti-Semitism. 
Thank you so much. Ambassador Herzog. We had uh, many powerful speeches and there's uh, not much to add. And I want to thank all the speakers uh, for your words. I just want to emphasize that uh, the uh, atrocities carried out by Hamas in terms of the abuse of women on October 7th were systematic. These were not isolated incidents. Each and every place where Hamas invaded, Kibbutzim, military bases, in the uh, musical festival, everywhere there, was, uh, there were cases of rape. This was both a culture and a strategy. And we have to understand that. So as we think about how to uh, sound our voice, uh, let's remember that this was both a culture and a strategy, and it has to, to be addressed as such. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else have anything to add before I close? I just want to thank all of our participants today for their powerful and poignant and remarkable testimony. Um, the purpose of this forum was to ensure that we can do all we can using the platform of the United States House of Representatives to penetrate the deafening silence that has existed since October 7th when it comes to the atrocities that were perpetrated against Israelis, against Jews, and that we know are continuing against the hostages who are still being held for 131 days. It is never acceptable under any circumstance to dehumanize any people, to consider anyone less than. That does include Palestinians, Israelis, Jews, Bedouins, Muslims, anyone. We are all equal, and we should all be treated in the same way when it comes to the perpetration of atrocities. Unfortunately, since October 7, uh, that has not been the case. There has seemed to be, there has been an asterisk next to the discussions around the horrors uh, that we witnessed in our uh, closed-door briefing today and that we have seen and heard firsthand and secondhand testimony from family members um, as, their, uh, as their loved ones have come home. This forum was the start of ensuring that we will continue the white-hot spotlight that we shown today on the outrage of ignoring and disbelieving and dismissing the atrocities perpetrated against Israeli and Jewish women, that we will stand together as humans to ensure that the world knows that violence against anyone, sexual and gender-based violence against anyone, will never be tolerated, and that we will push back hard to ensure that the world, that the, the peace-loving, equitable world, will stand together in the face of it. Thank you all so much for joining us.